please welcome to the stage, Lona Frank, everybody. I probably should have chosen some other surprise. <laughs> well, um, this may sound a bit strange, but um, I don't remember a time in my life when I wasn't aware of mental illness. And I mean acutely aware. Even when I was a little kid, um, some of my earliest memories are of being together with hardcore mental patients. And this is because um, when I was little, uh, my mother was a psychiatric nurse in Aarhus, Denmark, which is uh, the country's second largest city. Um, and there was a big mental hospital there, and she was in, in the geriatric ward. So she was taking care of patients who had been ill for, I mean, decades. And some of them had you know, been hospitalized for that long. And they were pretty much all of them hardcore paranoid schizophrenics. And um, I loved these patients, really. Uh, every day, I would go see some of them uh, because my dad would pick me up and uh, go when my mother's shift was over. Um, and so we'd go and I'd you know, go up the stairs and you know, look for my favorite patients that would be really, really anxious to see me because I was the only kid they ever saw. I was this you know, three, four-year-old kid. And their families uh, never came to see them, basically. So some of these patients uh, were really, really nice to me. I remember one who would make stuffed animals for me in therapy. Um, very strange ones. Like I remember an elephant with very, very long legs and made out of red and white checkered cloth, um, which I loved, definitely. Uh, and I was very fascinated with these people because they were certainly strange in many ways. And I would, you know, we would talk at um, the dinner conversation at home would be about, so how was my mother's day? And yeah, it had been fine. You know, this patient had thrown a knife at somebody and had to be restrained, but otherwise it was all good. And I was like, I would sit there with big eyes and, and you know, why, why are they like this? Why are they like this? Well, because they have a different view of reality. In fact, you know, they often hear voices that will tell them to do these things. And I remember that really intrigued me to the point where I would sometimes get in the bathroom and turn off the light and lock the door and just sit there and try, really try to hear voices. I mean, could I, could I just hear something? Um, I never succeeded. Um, but soon after, I, I realized that mental illness was not just something that other people had. It was not something that just people in hospitals had. In fact, it was rampant in my own family. I remember the first time I went to see an aunt of mine at the same, very same hospital in a different ward, and she was in there to have a course of electroshock treatments. So she would be in there for severe depression, and we would go see her. And she would sit there, normally a very talkative lady, that was suddenly completely silent and just looked very odd and gray. And I thought, well, you know, schizophrenia, apparently people hear voices, and depression must be a disease that makes very talkative people shut up. It's odd. Well, it was a little more serious than that, I soon found out, because the story of my grandmother, um, my mother's mother, um, turned out that she had been severely depressed. In the 50s, she was hospitalized for a year. She didn't get out of bed. Uh, in the end, they wanted to give her a lobotomy, and she was only saved by the bell. You know, a family doctor saying, don't do this, don't do this. And it turned out, when I talked a little bit more to my mother about this, well, her father, so my mother's uh, grandfather, had in fact shot himself over severe depression gone out into the barn and just shot himself. And it was, it turned out this mental illness in the family wasn't just something of the past. Um, I think I was about in my teens when uh, my father, who had a lot of uncles and aunts, suddenly one of these uncles went out into the woods um, where he lived and hung himself because of depression. And it took him another couple of years, and an aunt, actually, she lived in the country, 
she went out one day, very depressed, and drowned herself in the great big tank where they keep the pig shit. And that really, to me, that brought home that you know, depression is not just any old disease. It's a really, really devastating, miserable, awful thing. And it got even closer to home when a few years later, uh, when I was grown up, my father was um, suddenly diagnosed with bipolar disease and also you know, very prone to depressions now and then. Now, all this would be what a psychiatrist would call a very interesting family history. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I must admit that, that growing up, I always had that feeling of, I wonder if this curse is also going to hit me. I mean, is, it, can, I even, can I even avoid this at all? And well, not surprisingly, um, I did develop depression. Um, from my early 30s, I've sort of battled you know, manageable depressions, bouts of depressions that can be treated with antidepressants and so on. So that's all well and good, but I've always had that strange feeling of, what if it gets worse? I mean, this time the drugs work, but what if they don't next time? Will I end up having electroshock treatments? Um, will I end up in some ward somewhere? Um, will I end up killing myself, for Christ's sake? Um, and then, a few years ago, as everybody knows, consumer genomics, personal genomics, suddenly became a reality. Now we can all go out and get genetic information about ourselves and about our disease risks. And I thought, and at this point, um, I'm, you know, I'm a science writer, I have a background in neuroscience, uh, a PhD, and so I thought, well, this seems to be a great topic for a book. I mean, personal genomics, suddenly we can all get genetic information, something that was really just totally intangible and unrealistic for the average person to get their hands on. And why not make it a really you know, personal book, use myself as, as the guinea pig, because, you know, I have some questions about my, uh, you know, uh, the heritability of, of depression, not the least. And so, um, I start out uh, doing this book, doing the research, um, finding out, so where can I get these various genetic tests? And I take various consumer genomic tests. You probably all know 23andMe out in Silicon Valley. I get that one, uh, it sort of starts it all off, and that's all, you know, well and good. It's, it's all somatic disease. It's, you know, it's your risk for gout, it's your risk for diabetes and all that stuff. I could deal with that. Um, they don't do genes for uh, mental illness, and there aren't very many. But in fact, it turns out that there is a handful of genes that seem to be somehow connected with depression, anxiety, even behavioral problems, and you know, a lo lower stress threshold. So I get really interested in that. Where can I get those genes tested? And I find out that there is actually a project, research project going on at the University of Copenhagen, where they're looking at this handful of genes um, and you know, the connection between those and your personality and mental illness, disease, and, um, depression, and anxiety. So I call them up and say, well, I have a suggestion. I would like to um, you know, volunteer to be in your study um, if you would let me you know, get the results, my own personal results, and let me use them in the book. And they say, fine, you know, come in. And so first of all, you know, I come in, they draw blood for the genetic uh, studies, and I get a personality test. So the, um, the five-factor model, which you probably also heard of, that we have sort of five dimensions in our personality that we score somewhere between very low and very high. Extroversion, for example, neuroticism, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. So uh, the first thing, I get in to see a psychologist who has analyzed my personality test. And um, he looks at me sort of 
weird, and says, "Are so you Lona?" Yeah, well, I am. Uh, I'd like to, you know, could you explain my results? Yeah, I just have to say first that I was analyzing your results yesterday, and I was really not looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so he, 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 you know, he puts out the results, and it seems that you know neuroticism is fairly high. Okay, I can sort of live with that, but agreeableness is like rock bottom. And he says, I've just never seen that in a woman before. Never. Um, well. And um, well, low agreeableness and high neuroticism kind of correspond very well to a predisposition for depression. So already that doesn't you know, point in the right direction. Doesn't sound good. Um, but the next thing is I go in and see the PI, uh, the professor, who has my genetic results. And she takes them out and she explains, you know, there are these five genes and they basically all have you know, two variants. You can have a robust variant, and you can have what you, we call a risk variant or a vulnerable variant that you know predisposes you to uh, depression, anxiety, stress, so on. Um, and of course, you have all your genes. You get one version from your mother, one, one from your father. And so, okay, I said, well, let's get the results. And she starts with number one. Well, this gene, let's see. Oh, you have you know two copies of the risk variant. Okay, and the next one. Oh, you have two copies of the risk variant. And the third one, the same. The fourth one, the same. The fifth one, the same. And I'm sitting there getting really depressed. <laughs> and, uh, sort of, you know, like, I, I feel like a loser in the genetic lottery. Like, I'm this lousy specimen. And, I walk out of there sort of with a cloud hanging over me, like, you know, I can see myself, you know, going into an asylum somewhere, never coming out, you know, or, you know, hanging myself, whatever it is. I feel kind of doomed, you know, like this, oh, this is going to happen. I am going to be one of those family casualties. And um, I have to say my uh, long-suffering boyfriend, he left for a few days. Yeah, uh, yeah, he couldn't stand being around that sort of mood. Anyway, um, so I start getting into, I have to write this book, um, and I start working on it, and I sort of get into the research about these genes and what they mean. And the more I read, um, the more I get this whole thing sort of turned around in my mind. And I end up saying to myself, well, wait a minute, you get this information, you get this knowledge that you have this probably fairly strong, you know, um, predisposition, biological predisposition to this disease that you've seen and you've seen the results of it. But what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you're determined, that, you know, your future is definitely, you know, deep depression. Because now you have, you know, this knowledge and what you can start you can start think, thinking differently. And what, with what I know about neuroscience, I also know, well, the brain is a very, very plastic organ. It is not determined. You change it all, your, all the time by what you do with yourself. And you change your brain by thinking. And the way you think affect your brain chemistry and the cells in there and everything that happens. And so, I come to the result, really, that, wait a minute, knowing, just knowing that there is this much biology to the bad moods and the depression in itself creates a sort of distance. So when I come to that moment when I'm sort of sliding down towards that you know, gray puddle that is depression, I can kind of stop myself by saying, this is your biology talking. It's just brain stuff happening. It doesn't mean that you should look at the world this way. So think differently. And I have to say it actually works. It is the best non-chemical antidepressant I've tried. And I'm sometimes thinking, what would have happened in, if those family members of mine had lived in a time where we could get you know, deep 
knowledge about our own biology and how we function. I mean, would it had would they have been less miserable? Would it, would it have saved their lives? Because I really, really deeply feel for myself that you know, the more I have insight into my own biology and its you know, intricate, fascinating mechanisms, the more I can control my moods, the more I can shape my life, and I can actually be a better version of myself. Thank you. Wolfram Dan equates a book about and describe the quadrant of the world by the manner in which the whole world is asked. Like a left side, the puzzling thing is this. Those equations have built in a kind of